Hello, my name is Janice DiLorenzo. As a founding member of URI's Women's Leadership Council, I was excited to collaborate with two of my fellow members and classmates, Marilyn Conti Zatarian and Victoria Salcone Cataldo, to create this unique pictorial tour celebrating the history of women after whom buildings at URI were named. Throughout this tour, you will see historical photos and artifacts and learn new details about the women behind the names. While we won't be covering every woman whose name appears on campus buildings and walls, you will come to know a little more about these women and why they may have been chosen. I hope you will enjoy this presentation and the look back into URI history. But first, here are some special remarks from Marilyn Conti Zatarian, another founding member of the Women's Leadership Council. Edwards, Ranger, Green, Lippitt, Taft, Barlow, Keeney, Washburn, Butterfield. If these names seem familiar to you, chances are you have noticed them on buildings on our beautiful Kingston campus. Many of these men played an important role in the history of the university academically, politically, or financially, and were honored by having their name appear on buildings or placed on a plaque for all to see. It wasn't until 1938 that the first building was named for a woman. As the Women's Leadership Council celebrates Women's History Month, let's take a look back to a campus that looked very different than it does today and see how important women were to the campus we know and love. Victoria Salcone Cataldo, also a founding member, will begin the tour with the first building dedicated to a woman, Roosevelt Hall. Our first stop is Roosevelt Hall, dedicated in October, 1938. Roosevelt Hall was one of the three buildings constructed on campus under President Roosevelt's post-depression New Deal Public Works Administration. Designed by Providence's own Albert Harkness in the federal revival style, it was the first building on campus not constructed of westerly granite, but instead is made of brick. To commemorate the occasion, activist First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt accompanied by then URI president Raymond Bressler, planted a flowering crab apple tree on the north side of the main door. She also ceremoniously lit a fire inside the fireplace, welcoming the young women to their new dormitory. The next building featured is Hutchinson Hall, dedicated on October 18, 1958, in honor of Anne Marbury Hutchinson. Built as a dormitory, it currently houses approximately 115 students and is part of a four building engineering, living and learning community. Anne Hutchinson is considered one of the earliest American feminists. As a spiritual leader, she had challenged male authority and indirectly acceptable gender roles. As a trained midwife, she developed strong ties to women in her community and held discussion meetings for both women and men challenging the tenets of Puritan beliefs. As a result, she was summarily banished from the Massachusetts Bay Colony, and she moved south to found a colony on Aquidneck Island, which would merge decades later with the colony settled by Roger Williams to become the Rhode Island Colony. In addition to the dedication of Hutchinson Hall on October 18th, 1958, another building was also dedicated, this time for Helen E. Peck. Peck served many roles at the then named Rhode Island State College. The name was changed to the University of Rhode Island in 1951. Between 1915 and 1941, she was a librarian, English professor, English department chair, and ultimately Dean of Women. A little known fact is that at one time, Helen Peck was the sole music instructor on campus. The year 1958 is memorable for more than just the dedication of Hutchinson and Peck Halls. It was also the year Lucy Cohen's Tucker passed away. Lucy Tucker, for whom Tucker Hall was dedicated in 1961, 
was one of the first students to attend the newly opened Rhode Island College of Agriculture and Mechanic Arts, the college we know today as the University of Rhode Island. Although she ultimately finished her degree at Bryant College in 1897, she returned to Kingston and for over 50 years held many administrative positions. She was personal secretary for presidents Washburn, Butterfield and Edwards, and later registrar and admissions officer for presidents Woodward and Bressler. She was awarded an honorary master of science degree in 1945, one year before her retirement in re recognition for her dedicated service and for her efforts in raising academic standards and scholastic achievements of faculty and students. Because she lived for many years in a wooden house on Upper College Road, it is informally called Tucker House and has been the unique second home of the history department for over 40 years. Next on our tour is Merrill Hall, a dormitory also dedicated in 1961 to honor Harriet Lathrop Merrow, a botanist. At 36 years of age, Harriet Merrow was recruited by Rhode Island College of Agriculture and Mechanic Arts to establish a department of botany when the college was in its infancy. When she arrived in 1895, she joined a small faculty of 25 and was the first woman to chair a department. It was Merrow's responsibility to recruit students and create the curriculum. Just weeks after her arrival, College Hall, used by the botany department, was destroyed by fire. It was quickly rebuilt and is now known as Davis Hall. Professor Merrill persevered and remained at the college for 26 years until her retirement. As the only member of the botany department, she taught all classes while gathering and preserving an extensive collection of microfungi. Her work was recognized by many universities and colleges, including Harvard and Cornell. While this image shows the new Fasciatelli Center for Advanced Engineering that opened in 2019, this piece of land once included Gilbreth Hall, the original home to industrial and manufacturing engineering. Gilbreth Hall was dedicated on May 26, 1962, to a unique husband-wife team of management consultants, Lillian and Frank Gilbreth. Although dedicated to both for their groundbreaking work in industrial engineering, Lillian is cre credited as a pioneer in industrial and organizational psychology. With 12 children and a full-time career, Lillian Gilbreth invented items that would help her run households more efficiently. This includes the foot-pedaled trash can, shelves inside refrigerator doors, and an electric food mixer. Lillian found time to attend the dedication of this building in 1962 at the age of 84. At this dedication, President Francis Horn said, at URI, we believe that women should be encouraged to enter the engineering profession. And perhaps the example of a building named for a man and wife team will be an unspoken influence on other young women to emulate Mrs. Gilbreth's career. Lillian Gilbreth and her family were immortalized in the book and film, Cheaper by the Dozen. In 1984, a commemorative Lillian Gilbreth postage stamp was issued. The next stop on our tour is the dormitory Fairweather Hall. Dedicated in 1970, the honor was a fitting tribute to Sarah Fairweather, who impacted history both in Rhode Island and in Southern Connecticut. She was born Sarah Harris to free farmers in 1812 in Norwich, Connecticut. At age 20, she was the first black woman in the United States to attend an all white women's school, the Canterbury Female Boarding School amidst great community opposition and harassment. She married George Fairweather III, a blacksmith from Rhode Island, and they moved to Kingston Village near the family blacksmith shop and home. George and Sarah joined the Kingston Anti-Slavery Society, hosted lectures, and circulated literature to local families. She traveled to meetings in Boston and New York and established lifelong correspondence with Helen and William Lloyd Darrison and Frederick Douglass, 
prominent abolitionists. The Fear of the Craft Guild nearby campus on Route 138, the restored blacksmith shop in form of family home of her husband, George, bears the name of this activist couple. Seven years later, after the dedication of Fairweather Hall on September 23rd, 1977, the first academic building was dedicated to a woman, White Hall, named for Louisa White, a pioneer in the field of nursing, especially at the University of Rhode Island. From 1947 to 1957, Louisa White was the first director of the College of Nursing. She had been instrumental in moving the certificate nursing program from School of Home Economics to its own college and was dedicated to implementing innovative nursing practices. She designed patient units to improve the efficiency of nursing care, and she insisted on academic rigor. Her innovations have resulted in the establishment of what would eventually become one of the most prestigious degree programs at URI. <clears throat> Though she was director of the nursing program for only 10 years, she left a legacy of excellence and scholastic competition, which underscores the College of Nursing today. The building has been renovated and modernized to provide the most up-to-date medical equipment and technology. But the essential patient care and academic excellence established by Louisa White are still the hallmarks of the nursing program. A Rhode Island native, Louisa White was inducted posthumously into the Rhode Island Heritage Hall of Fame in 2019. 30 years would pass before another building was named after a woman at URI. For her ongoing support and years of help, the Two Building International Engineering Program, or IEP, Living and Learning Community, was named the Heidi Kirk Duffy Center for International Engineering Education and dedicated September 28, 2007. IEP Advisory Chair Heidi Kirk Duffy had been a committed supporter of the program since its founding and served as its board chair for over 20 years. German by birth, she was able to help the IEP make some of its original connections with companies in Germany. Heidi Kirk, along with her husband, Chester, a URI graduate and founder of Antwal, a successful engineering company, worked as a team with Professor of German, John Grandin, and Dean of Engineering, Herman Dietz, the founders of the IEP program. They expanded the engineering program from its Kingston roots across the Atlantic to Germany. Working with contacts in Germany and the United States, Heidi Kirk Duffy was able to assist in creating an engineering program integrating language, culture, and business. She was awarded an honorary PhD from URI in 1995 and the Federal Cross of Honor from Germany, its highest civilian honor. Next on our tour is what was previously known as Independence Hall, now named Swan Hall and dedicated on May 14th, 2008 in honor of Dr. Beverly Swan, who held many roles at URI, including serving as URI's provost and vice president for academic affairs for 17 years. And over the course of her tenure, mentored many women, both students and faculty. We were able to connect with Dr. Swan for this program, and we'd like to share some anecdotes and memories from Dr. Swan directly. After I got my bachelor's degree, I stayed on and earned my master's degree. I had a graduate assistantship, so I had an office and taught in the then Independence Hall. I was teaching a class when someone rushed in to announce that the president had been shot. The president was John F. Kennedy, who died within hours. I was stunned when President Carruthers told me that he and my colleagues were proposing that Independence Hall be renamed Swan Hall in my honor. The procedure for naming buildings is a complex one, starting within the university and traveling through the board of directors to the legislature, which takes the final vote. 
I remember the day of the dedication, family from around the country, friends from the university and beyond. The building had been completely rehabbed and looked wonderful as it does today. The president had commissioned that metal swan sculpture, which hangs in the lobby as a gift to me. I still cannot believe this wonderful tribute. I get goosebumps even today when I see the sign as I drive by the building. Dr. Swan was awarded the Distinguished Achievement Award from the URI in 2013. And to highlight this achievement and hear more from Dr. Swan, here is the video produced for DAA. Well, it was a very exciting time. I came here in 1959. The campus was much smaller at the time. And uh, it was just exciting. It was a little bit frightening for me as a freshman because it didn't seem so small then. It seemed like a large campus. And, um, but it was exciting. And there was just so much to learn and so much to see. I came as a math major. And then I took English with Nancy Potter and I became an English major, and that's what I stayed <laughs> all, through all of my degrees. I enjoyed doing that. When it first opened, it was called GCB, which was General Classroom Building. And then uh, it was named Independence Hall, and now it's Swan Hall. The best thing I like about it is going into that main uh, atrium and seeing all the students sit around the table studying, reading papers, and uh, uh, it's very exciting for me. I remember the day it was uh, dedicated my family was here from various parts of the country. And there used to be a driveway between Swan Hall and the President's house. And it had a sawhorse in front of it, it was blocked off. And I had my family, some family members with me, so I pulled up and I said to the, the policeman, I said, uh, you know, I'd like to park here. And he said, oh, you can't. He said, this is for the Swan Hall dedication. And I got the opportunity to say, I'm Swan. <laughs> it was fun. It was fun. <laughs> so I was a, uh, a lecturer. I was a uh, sabbatical replacement. I was replaced someone who was on maternity leave. I replaced someone who fell off a chair. <laughs> and then I got a full-time position, but it wasn't a continuing position. And then um, there was uh, an opening and I applied and had a position in the English department in the college writing program specifically. And I taught writing uh, English modern drama, linguistics, things like that. My final position here, and then that position was upgraded, I became vice provost, and then there was an, a national search for the provost position after the vice president left. There was a national search, and I survived, I guess you say, and uh, I became provost, and I did that for 17 years. When I heard uh, from President Dooley that I was going to receive the DAA award, I was initially stunned I was at a, uh, a dinner for a, uh, uh, an administrator who was uh, leaving the university. And uh, th there was a reception first and then there was a dinner. There were about 10 of us at the table. And Dr. Dooley came in and he sat at the head of the table and we started to talk. And uh, he said to me, I want to talk to you. And uh, I said, oh, oh. <laughs> and uh, then he said to me, I hope you're not busy on October 25th because uh, I would like to present you with the DAA. And my first reaction was quickly thinking, what is the DAA? And then I remembered, of course, and uh, I, was, I was stunned, but I was absolutely thrilled. What an honor that is uh, to, to be recognized, especially since I've been gone for a few years. From a student attending classes in the newly dedicated Independence Hall to the renaming of the building honoring Beverly Swan, Dr. Swan's remarkable academic journey has certainly come full circle. We are truly proud to have Dr. Swan as part of the URI community. Now we will continue to the last building on our tour. On November 6th, 2008, just a few months after the Swan Hall dedication, another woman was honored. Dr. Kathleen M. Mellon, who had died in 2006 after a long battle with breast cancer. In her memory, the Cooperative Extension Education Center, which she established in 1985, was renamed the Kathleen M. Mellon Outreach Center. 
Located on East Alumni Avenue on the Kingston campus, the center also oversees the adjacent botanical gardens and the learning landscape educational program for children. She devoted 30 years of service to URI where she is best known for transforming the master gardener program from a small garden club to a vibrant volunteer outreach program. Dr. Mallon became a national leader in delivering research-based horticultural education to the general public. She even had a very popular how-to call-in television spot on local channel 10. Most notably, Dr. Mallon was instrumental in the design and development of the Ryan Center and the Boss Arena as well. Dr. Mallon is known for her numerous contributions to URI in surrounding communities, businesses, and colleges. This marks the end of our presentation, and we hoped you enjoyed it. While we weren't able to get to all the sites on campus named after women, we'd like to mention the Helen Mosby Center, the Charles and Marie Fish Building, and the Ann Gall Durbin Research Aquarium on the Narragansett Bay campus. On the main campus, you will find the George and Ann Ryan Neuroscience Institute, the Anna Fasciatelli Fitness and Wellness Center, the Eleanor Carlson Strength and Conditioning Center, and the Agnes Duty Auditorium. Women have made and will continue to make an impact on the URI campuses and on the history of the university from its inception to today. For more information on today's program and on the Women's Leadership Council, here is Sarah Bordalo, Assistant Director, Alumni Engagement. I would like to thank Janice DiLorenzo, Marilyn Conti Zartarian, and Victoria Salcone Cataldo of the Women's Leadership Council for their research and commitment to this project. I would also like to thank Michaela Crimmins, Program Manager in Alumni Engagement, and Jillian Delpreet on our student staff for their technical support. A special thanks to Karen Morse of URI's Distinctive Collections and Matt Dallaire of the Annual Fund at the URI Foundation and Alumni Engagement for their contributions and love of URI history. On behalf of the Women's Leadership Council, I invite you to learn more about the council by visiting the website listed here. We are always looking for new members, so we encourage you to complete the member interest form on the council's webpage. The Women's Leadership Council also supports the Women Transforming Women Scholarship. This scholarship is awarded annually and each year helps a woman identified student fund her URI education. We encourage you to give to this important scholarship by visiting the website listed in the program notes below. Thank you so much for watching and we hope to see you on future Women's Leadership Council programs.